Next, whatever happened to Zwirl Quern? Oh, Johnny, you remember the word you made up for when you have your mouth full of peanut butter and you can't just... I, if you're going to do a close-up, I want to... If you have a mouth full of peanut butter and you, a sandwich, you can't swallow it. My brother made up a word. Glam. <laughs> Glam. Also, the name he made up for me for the stage was Zwoll Quern. <laughs> It's very hard to stay at the bottom the way I have. I started, I, I, I worked my way down to the bottom and I've stayed there. I mean, my whole life has been backwards. I used to be young, now I'm old. I had straight teeth, now they're crooked. I don't know what I'm doing here in the first place, and I don't even think this outfit's attractive. I was just in town as the uh, entertainment editor of the uh, Los Angeles Times, and this lady burst into my office, and Janet always bursts into offices, I feel, and uh, said that, that she thought she was doing public relations for the Ashgrove nightclub, didn't know how to do it, and wanted my advice on how to, how to do it. Janet was the only legacy of a former marriage I had to a motion picture star whom she taught how to rumba. I was having a coffee at Bloomingdale years ago. All of a sudden, I turn around and a lady looks at me and says to me, God, are you good looking? I couldn't believe it. I met her in California, in Hollywood, a lot of years ago and we didn't like each other at all. Where did I ever meet her? It was as though all of a sudden she was there. And when I have to go back and think about where did I meet Janet, it was with the production of Orson Welles' company of uh, Faust. She was a member of the company at the time that I joined it. How did I get to Europe? Well, I remember, I don't know if it was my father or Arthur Lawrence I was talking to when I said, I either have to take a plane to L.A. at 2.30 or a boat to Europe at 4. It was my father, okay, he was a Republican. And he said, uh, I don't understand. I don't understand what you mean. I said, well, Daddy, I found $400 in a bank account. Anyway, while I was talking to him, I missed the plane to L.A., so I took the boat to Europe. I was stuck there for two and a half years because I didn't have any money to get back. So I thought I might as well get analyzed. You know, being psychoanalyzed in French is very easy. He doesn't know what you're talking about. You don't know what he's talking about. And that's when I got a call from Orson Welles. I thought it was a joke. They said, Orson wants you. So I went over to him. I said, yes. He said, well, I mean, you've been asking me for a job. But I, I said, no, no, no. But I finally got Lauren Jardis. And you couldn't hear me say no. So the answer is yes, you're working for me. He did a magic show, and I was the woman he sawed in half. And he was absolutely furious that I wasn't better looking. And I was furious that I wasn't better looking. Orson wanted to be very serious about what he had to say and what he had to direct. And Janet never took... <laughs> Janet never took it seriously. She was always asking, but why? <laughs> why do I have to do that when it's so logical for me to do this, you know? So. I was a bunch of, we were a bunch of, um, I don't know what we were, servants or slaves or something. Eartha Kid was the head, uh, Helen of Troy. And I was supposed to say, come on to the workers, what have you got in that box? And she says, I don't know. Well, I turned my head to say, to, 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 to tell them all to come on, and this schmuck kid, Jamie Schmidt, his face is right there. So I burst out laughing, <laughs> and I said, oh, what, what have you got in that box? <laughs> Wetting my pants at the same time, and Eartha Kitt says, I don't know! 
Austin said, she's fired, fired. And Kitty said, uh, Eartha said, uh, that's not fair, you can't fire her. And Austin says, fair? Whoever said I was fair? Are you going to be acting before that? So yes, I was, no, not so called acting. I was a fantastic actress. I told Je Shelley Winters over the years, I've been telling Shelley, I am a much better actress than you, and she says, prove it, and that's the end of the discussion. She could have been an extraordinary writer, that's for sure. I mean, if you could have bottled Janet, you would have had a combination of the Marx Brothers and uh, Genet. Oh, she is a great actress. I don't know what a great actress is. If you mean a, a great actress has a way to communicate feelings, she is that. I don't know if she could be a commercial actress because I, she would change the script every night. She would probably jump off the stage and get involved with a handsome member of the, uh, of the audience, invite him out to dinner and ask him to invite her out to dinner. Uh, there would never be a third act. I taught Arthur Murray how to dance. Um, I don't know if I had that in writing. Oh, she had quit being a Roomba teacher, which she must have done for 12 days and four minutes. And she had become a disc jockey and interviewer on a radio station. She's not the most of this and she's not the most of that. But when you put all the things together, she is the most unique, extraordinary person I have ever known in my life. And probably, that's true with a lot of people who have met her. Uh, there are groups of people, for instance, who meet periodically just to tell Janet Wolfe stories. Farley Granger has a million. When she was his secretary and they went, when he was doing Senso, was that the one in Italy? All these funny stories. Like she took a job as an interpreter and didn't speak Italian. And he t <laughs> it took him uh, about uh, seven months to find out that this girl he brought to Italy to be his interpreter on the set did not speak Italian. By then she was running the movie and she was working for uh, uh, Visconti, I think. There was a whole new wave of Italian films, and she had this offer, or she never maneuvered it, I don't know, because she didn't speak Italian. But suddenly she was the script girl on Naked City, and another picture he did with Mignani. And once I had a big argument with Mignani, Mignani insisted that uh, Jana could speak Italian. And I know she, I can speak Italian, I've had two Italian husbands, but I can order in Italian. And I know Janet cannot speak Italian, maybe she understands it, but Mignani insisted that she could. Oh, Paisan, I was the, the liaison between the American army and the Italians. I wrote a part for myself in Paisan. I wrote a marvelous part for myself. And we sh a nurse, uh, the soldier, and we shot the whole thing. It took us a whole day to shoot it. And then we go into the projection room rustling. He says, what the hell has this got to do with the rest of the picture? And he said in Italian, but that's more or less the literal translation. The whole thing was cut out. So now anybody who sees Paisan, I'm on, they say, they don't even get a chance to say there's Janet. It's been my parts over. Cut, zing, bang, cut. I met Janet in Italy. Uh, I guess it was in December of 44, when we were all in the Bernini Hotel together in Rome. And she was in the Red Cross, and I was. And uh, she sort of exploded on us. She came in, and she was the most dramatic girl, very pretty, very lively, and very funny. And uh, none of us knew how she ever, why she ever wanted to be in the Red Cross seemed like such a staid place for Janet. Red Cross, I was in the Red Cross. Oh, anybody want me to tell them about the VD picture they show you when you get in the Red Cross? Or is that too disgusting? It was about the boy. I'm going to tell it when you can always not show it.
she is very demanding on her friends. But somehow you don't believe that she is, uh, she means it. She ha has no hesitation to ask very direct questions, not only to her friends, but to strangers. Janet isn't someone you meet casually, not any more than you crash land a plane casually. I mean, when you meet Janet, you have had an experience. To Janet, everybody was a friend, and this was very typical. When she'd go to nightclubs, she was crazy about nightclubs because she taught so many nightclub performers to dance. And if she kind of went to a nightclub and there was uh, every table, every table was taken, she thought nothing of sitting down with strangers and saying, you don't mind, do you? And somehow getting them to such a spell by her talk. And you know, there are these great, very brief friendships that form in a nightclub or, or a restaurant or an evening. And somebody says, listen, why don't you come with us so-and-so? Uh, uh, if it'll be a fine company, they say, why don't you come back to Mexico with us, or Persia, or wherever. Janet was the type who went. I don't know how I got to Caracas, actually. I think I was sitting in a nightclub one night called the Russian Bear, and there, was, there were two seats, and the man I was with didn't want to sit at this table, because he wanted to, no, he wanted to sit at this table so he could face the thing, the show. The next two people came and sat, had to sit with their backs, and one of them was a man called Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso, and he invited me to Caracas, Venezuela, to be a governess to his children. And we didn't know at the time that he was mixed up with a bunch of revolutionaries, and she got down to Venezuela and found that she was involved with the political fortunes of Romulo Betancourt prior to his becoming the president of Venezuela. As a matter of fact, he was, uh, she helped him out by hiding his guns under her lingerie and the uh, home she was staying in and uh, seemed to be very delighted to be involved to that extent in a left-wing revolution. This is a picture of her dog named Life. Uh, the headline in the article about uh, the dog says, Spanish barking dog bites reactionaries. And it says, Janet Wolf, lovable and lovely extrovert of the Rome Red Cross Officers Club, reported uh, with wide eyes amazement that Romulo Betancourt, who heads the revolutionary junta in Venezuela, once hid from the police in her bedroom. And she now quoted, did I know him? I think he used my toothbrush, and I know he used my comb. You should have seen the gat in my pink panties all wrapped up so the cops wouldn't find it. But I think about the kind of exotic things she's done, like hiding guns in South America in her underwear, and, um... <laughs> things along that line and I I would I would like my life to be sort of like that I'd like to be able to to do a lot of a lot of different kinds of things like that only my feeling is that because I'm sort of goal oriented I want it to all come together and lead somewhere whereas with mommy I don't think it was ever done with a sense of it go you know leading eventually somewhere I think she just did it because she would fall into things and the thing that's so incredible and in a way, what's sort of sad is that all these other people would recognize her abilities. She would have people hire her to write and hire her to, to do all sorts of things. And just on a, on a single meeting, they'd say, you'd be great. Here, you know, be public relations and, and, and write our scripts and do this and do that. And she would freeze and she would not feel she could do it. If I had my life to do over again, I would certainly, a lot of people say they do the same thing. Those are people like who are very successful people. I wouldn't do anything the same. One, I would have had an affair with Raffaloni. Two, I would be younger now. I've always had an age complex and it certainly hasn't gotten better. It's gotten better. I was more afraid of 14 and being 15 than I am of being uh, 48 again and again and again. But um, what was I saying before I interrupted myself? I was saying a very important thing. My mind. I cannot remember anything. I couldn't even remember the name of that disease where you forget things. If Janet concentrated her ability in any direction whatsoever, in any direction, with the singleness of purpose that she has, she could write symphonies, she could write plays, she could do anything. If she concentrated this incredible, single-purpose 
drive that she has. Uh, I suspect that she directed some of that toward getting married to me. Seems as though she may have given up her career for us, but with my mother, it's sort of complicated. I don't know if she gave up a career for her children and family as much as that she used it sort of as an excuse to not go after a career. And also, I think we're talking about a time when it was one thing to say a woman should have a career, and it was another thing to know exactly what that career could be and what, I suppose, persists as a man's world, but certainly was even more of a man's world 25, 30 years ago. I think all she ever wanted was I, I think I don't think she ever wanted to accomplish anything I just think she wanted to be loved the only person who really meant anything to me in my life who's ever stuck by me in my life was my older brother Johnny well, they, want to, they want to see us together she's 20 years younger than I am you 30 years believe. younger than he is I'm younger than he is, That's yeah, for the, and, and, and shorter. I used to be taller. So we, but we were much closer in age when we were younger. You were Isn't closer in age. I was closer. <laughs> well, was you're getting further away all the time. I Hi. think you should go, I think you chose a nice swim in the pool. Thank in your you bikini. very much. Oh. My brother you. Johnny. My mother did rotten things to me, like she said, you have to give a doll, doll away. I, I just remember this. So I put on, on her bed Isabel, a doll called Isabel that I didn't like much. That Isabel had a china face that kept breaking, and I'd repair it and give it back. And because I was a kind-hearted little girl, I put my Dutch doll, which was my favorite doll, next to Isabel to keep her company until she was given away. My mother gave away the Dutch doll <laughs> on the hand of crime. <laughs> I mean, um, she's, I, I was very upset. She said it was made of cloth and had germs. We were very germ conscious when we were kids. The family style was rather chaotic. Meals were always late. Uh, the house was in a relative state of disarray. And it was sort of an artistic environment. I mean, her mother was very musical and interested in music, and the father was a great bridge player. The father was a calm, charming, pleasant man who uh, was very easygoing. And he used to turn off the turmoil in the family by partly turning off his hearing aid in later years when he was, didn't hear very well. Her mother was an emotional uh, person, very lively, and uh, when younger had been, I suppose, somewhat charming, but very difficult person uh, to deal with. And, uh, and in a way, hated Janet with some kind of peculiar jealousy or whatever it was so that uh, they had a, a terrible relationship. Well, she once got pneumonia, and she said, uh, I said, uh, Mother, I've ordered, I was 20 years old, I've ordered peas and carrots and roast beef for the night for dinner. She says, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to be your father's wife and your brother's mother, but it's not going to work, miss. Miss is what she called me most of the time. Um, she said, look what Judy Holliday got, and look where Shelley Winters got. And you never got anywhere, miss. I saw her mother, Judy Holliday's mother, always stuck by her and told her she was beautiful. And Shelley Winter's mother uh, always stuck by her and told her she was beautiful. And my mother said, uh, well, you never were. What do you want me to do, lie? Which is funny now, ha-ha. Uh -huh. I don't remember laughing hysterically at the time. Uh <laughs> People don't know that rich people can have rotten childhoods. Black people don't know that white people can have rotten childhoods. But if you don't have love, <sighs> you spend the rest of your life looking for it. to the host that I was about to leave. It was around midnight. And uh, a young lady said, oh, I'll take you to uh, Figueroa. And I said, marvelous, great. And I got in the car. And for the duration of the war, 
felt that I was in much less danger in the Pacific than driving down Sunset Boulevard with Janet. I don't know quite sure how we got married. I think it's, I came to America, America, and I sent him a telegram saying, are we engaged? And he sent me back a telegram and saying, yes, telegram coming and I am following. I don't know why that got me very nervous. I didn't expect to really get married. <laughs> I was with my friend Lola Adler when that happened. My face fell. She said, what happened? I said, I think he proposed to me. Well, I, I don't remember proposing, no. I thought that if I married her, I wouldn't see so much of her. I thought she'd be busy because she's very talented, very witty. Uh, I think that really is, uh, and I didn't, I really didn't want not to see her. But I thought that if I married her, I would see less of her and enjoy more of what I saw. Mommy's very demanding, and Daddy doesn't like to have any demands made on him. And Mommy push, keeps pushing. I mean, knowing that, instead of stopping, she just keeps pushing. And that drives Daddy crazy. On the other hand, Daddy is very secretive, and he knows that that drives Mommy crazy. I mean, the whole, it's like, come on, guys. I was crazy about, I don't know, yeah, I'm always crazy about somebody who hates me. I mean, or, you know, who can just about tolerate me. No, it's past, and uh, we enjoy what we should always have enjoyed with each other, not necessarily married. We have a very good relationship now. First, she's the father of the kids. I'm not, not first, he always has been. And we're very good friends. Very, you know, we don't see each other, which makes it very easy. And, uh, now, and when we do, we get along very well. I have a picture of him hugging me, which I show everybody, and they say, why don't you get married again? And I said, ruin everything? <laughs> separated when I was very young. I was about three years old. And I think that because I was so young, I don't really remember them being together at all. And in fact, I remember when I was five years old, seeing my father in the hallway, thinking, you know, what's he doing here? We separated at a, when the, they were very, very young. And she went to California with them. And I had at least the satisfaction knowing that uh, she was instinctively quite a wonderful mother. I was very ill when I had children, which I don't care to discuss at this moment. I'm, I have these two old kids. Blah, blah, blah. He said, think of it as a challenge. So I thought, my God, yeah, it's a challenge. You know, I think because when we were little, she was so much there for us. I still think that she's very strong, and, she, and I, think of, I do think of sort of a nurturing person. I think, and I don't think in that intellectually. I mean, I think, Mommy! She was a, she is still to this day, you know, very, very good mother, which is um, not what you would normally expect, really. I know that sounds rather strange, because she's so self-involved in her own world that you'd hardly expect to find little children in there. Although she had, her tenderness was always directed toward little creatures, little dogs, little cats. Would stop on the middle of Fifth Avenue if she saw a little kitten who needed something and would rush it over to Shraps for a sandwich or something. My mother was about 40 years old when she had my sister, her first child. And I think that, you know, I would like to think that she was very much ahead of her time and that she was, um, this is my cat Sophie right here, everybody. Um, I would like to think that she was ahead of her time um, and had, you know, determined that she was not going to have children until she was in her 40s or late 30s. But I think that, uh, I don't think that's the way it happened. I think she just kind of, you know, just evolved that way. Her life evolved. She's not what you typically would think of when you think of a mother. She's, she's not uh, dignified. She's not... Um, You know, when you bring friends home, you sort of wonder if she's going <laughs> to be okay. My mother has always embarrassed me. Um, ever since I was a kid, I was afraid of what she might say or do next. And I think that that's always going to be, it's always going to be that way between us. Um, I will always pretend I don't know her in restaurants or on trains. And that's just life. Uh, but I do love her spontaneity. I, I, I adore that part of her.
So I will put up with being embarrassed, I think. Easy things she cannot do. Two plus two, two plus three. She can't do that. If things get a little bit difficult, you have a better chance at it. But if it's impossible, that's easy for her to do. I run something called the New York City Housing Authority Symphony Orchestra. You try raising money with a name like that. The way I do it, it's very simple. I go up to a man and I say, if you give me enough money, you don't have to sleep with me. And he says, how much is enough? 14 years ago, the chairman of the Housing Authority was Simeon Golar, and I said, Sim, I've got these two kids to support. Could you give me a job? And he said, uh, what could you do for the Housing Authority? I said, nothing. So he said, listen, I grew up in public housing. I was never exposed to classical music. Could you start a symphony orchestra? And I said, sure. <laughs> been for the uh, low man on the totem pole. That's part of Janet's heart. The message she gives to uh, humanity is that the underdog should get more attention. Janet would lend, would, would pay the rent for all the players in the orchestra if she were wealthy. She'd pay all their phone bills. She would give them her last dime and she wouldn't have anything, right? Somehow or other at this stage in her life she does it all and keeps the orchestra alive. Should I just keep on going like this about my life? Well, the only man I ever said no to, I mean, I've said no to, oh my God, I've said no to so many men. The one man, isn't that? Did something happen? What was that? What'd you do, Joan? I guess what I'm saying is that I hope she doesn't have real regrets about her achievements to date, because I think that she has touched more people uh, positively than almost anybody of my acquaintance. It's what's so wonderful about her, and it's maybe not a gift that the world measures in the sense that it will measure J. Paul Getty. But on the other hand, uh, it's th those are wonderful gifts. I think they're they're uh, rare and uh, precious, and she's got them. Hail upon the bell of you do sole, of you do sole da calor da 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 scendo lentamente nelle vene, e pian piano something fine al cuore, nas compose something prima con il prima sun, I don't think those are the right words. <laughs>